Well, hello, Arizona, and welcome to Arizona Talk Radio, hosted by Rob Scribner and Derek Rinchler. Join us as we talk about Arizona facts and news, and then maybe just a little bit of gossip. Grab yourself a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, kick back, and enjoy the hour with Rob and Derek. Arizona Talk Radio is part of Cutting Edge Radio Network. And now, let's start the show. Well, hello, Arizona, and everybody's watching us, uh, even beyond Arizona. Welcome to the show, and I have a special guest today. <laughs> it's Tracy Callum, and uh, let me fix the screen so I don't have double of you there. There we go. <laughs> and uh, uh, Tracy has lived in Arizona for a very long time and uh, has some really good things to share with people, especially moving down here. And uh, also uh, when it comes to jobs, employment, and uh, interviews. So I thought it'd be great to have her on the show. And Derek uh, was, uh, had another obligation, so it's like, this was perfect, just perfect. So um, anyway, so before we get going, now I want to remind you that you can find our show as a podcast at aztalkradio.com. And we play Arizona Talk Radio on a regular basis every day on Good Talk Radio, which is a, a syndication that we do. And uh, so, yeah, so don't hesitate to uh, come visit us. We're also on iHeartRadio. You can find us on Spreaker. You can find us on iTunes and TuneIn and all over the place. So, and Spotify. So, uh, Tracy, how you yes. doing? Good. How are you? <laughs> Pretty good. Now, I'll go ahead and give out the secret, but uh, Tracy is my daughter. <laughs> and so, uh, it was kind of funny. It's like, uh, it's like, hey, Tracy, you want to be on the radio today? <laughs> <laughs> and we've never set you up on Skype. We've never nope. done anything. So we had to do all this in about an hour. And you've been wonderful. Absolutely great. Yeah. And I love your decorations in the background. I figured they were very Arizona appropriate. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and uh, just to uh, let you know that we may see a young man. Uh, is he six now or five? He's about to turn six. Yeah, I thought he was turning six. So my grandson may pop in the screen once in a while, and that's okay with me. Uh, I Well, I'd love him to death. That's the first thing. But the <laughs> second part is uh, he's never been home with you doing an interview on Skype before, so it's going to be new to him. So uh, we're going to be patient, and we may get interrupted. And, and I've got my dog next to me who could easily be Birkin or something, you know, so that's just how it goes. But um, Tracy's been a hiring manager for uh, uh, several, uh, what, more than one company? No, I actually, more yeah. than one company yeah. and probably over a decade, <laughs> probably <laughs> over a decade by now. Yeah, so uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit, but there's one little, I have a little pet peeve I wanted to bring up is, uh, you know, uh, uh, Everybody's been kind of up in uh, arms about politics and issues and stuff like that, and I'm not going to get into those. Uh, some of us have, you know, um, um, conservative ideas, and others have liberal, and that's okay. That's 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 how things are. The only thing I really want to do is urge people to use their voice, not by protesting and do all. That. You can do that too, but make sure you register to vote this year. 2018 uh, is important. Um, I tend to be on the conservative side, but I do agree with a lot of issues on the liberal side. Um, but I, I don't have the right to complain or have an opinion if I don't vote. And so what I'm urging anybody that's watching us, it doesn't matter if you're in Arizona or not, um, or what state or country you're in, please, um, while well, in the United States, please register to vote and go vote and give people your, um, your opinion. And uh, your, vo you know, your voice and your um, vote count. So uh, that's my biggest wish for everyone is if you're fed up or you want things to continue the way they are and, and let the uh, administration we have now finish what they've started, then make sure you vote and make sure that he gets the support they need. If you don't like it and you want to see things change to a different uh, scenario, you need to vote. And that's just all there is to it. And so uh, that this preaching I'm doing is for myself and my wife, too. We've kind of like slacked off a little bit in some things, even our local politics. 
and no more. We're not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to sit in front of the news and be frustrated and do nothing. And I just want to urge all young people, uh, middle-aged folks, baby boomers, register and vote, please, 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 please. So Tracy, yes, how long you been in Arizona now? I am been here since 2006. So wow, about 10, we're 10, 11, 12 years. Almost 12 years now. Wow. So it's kind of funny because, you know, you grew, we grew up in Washington State in Oregon. Yeah. And uh, you came down here a lot sooner than we ever did. In fact, I remember when you were down, I was like, I will never move down here. <laughs> it's like never going to happen. <laughs> and then as we uh, started doing a lot of RV travels and stuff, uh, the start place kind of started growing on us a little bit. Uh, the summers are intensive. <laughs> Uh, what what do you, uh, what's the temperature over there? You're in Gilbert, right? I'm in Gilbert right now, and uh, I don't know what it is at the moment, but it's supposed to reach 108 today, I believe. Yeah. Um, and we're just re real quick. I'm oh. not sure that the stream is working on Facebook, by the way. Um, I think yeah, you are. Okay. Yeah, just refresh your page. All right. I yep. was like, it doesn't wasn't showing that it was functioning yeah no let me know and uh, okay anybody's watching and stuff if you're if you're having any trouble with sound or anything please let us know in the chat and uh, anyway so uh, I want to remind people also when they're watching the show that you can also there's a YouTube version of this and a podcast version so and a lot of folks because we do our show in the mid-afternoon they're at work and stuff like that so we usually get seen later but we still love to see people uh, put comments in the chat. Uh, so even if the show's already over with, please leave comments and uh, it gives us things to bring up for the next show. So so what I want to talk to Sh uh, Tracy about, because you're a younger <laughs> generation and I'm an old old hoot, kind of old school and theory X a little bit, uh, I, need, I need education and uh, and a lot of people um, uh, in this show, we want to address certain things like uh, moving to Arizona. If you want to come to Arizona and, and, and uh, get a new career or, or anything like that, we want to talk about the physical part about moving down here and talk about trying to get a job. And, and you're going to be awesome at this and stuff. But the first thing I want to do is let's say you, uh, I want to, I'm from Washington State, <laughs> which I was. What do I need to know about moving down here? What are some of the things you've noticed about people that come from other states down here uh, for the first time? Well, I can say the first thing is that a lot of people here have come from other states. So it's actually surprising to meet someone that is born and raised here. So very true. outsiders are definitely very well welcome and highly expected. Um, but it is an adjustment, um, especially if you're coming from a different climate. I think the biggest shock for most people is the change in weather because it is hot. And, it, you know, it's not like um, southern states where it's uh, humid, but it does get hot and it's hot for a good, you know, three, four months every year where it's makes it very challenging to do anything outside huh. so it tends to be your uh more of your winter where you're staying indoors or you're only going outside to do water activities like swimming or going to the lakes or something like that but for the most part our summers is when you spend more time indoors in the air conditioning than um the rest of the year but then you got nine months of beautiful weather to do quite a bit yeah. So have you found yourself to be a morning or evening person a little bit when it comes to the hot weather? In the hot weather, um, I tend to be more of an evening person. Yeah. But in spring and fall, definitely more of a morning person. And I love catching that uh, early morning when the sun's up, having the coffee outside and enjoying the weather. Why other people are complaining about snow. <laughs> And I, and, you know, I, I don't know what it is about this, and, and it seems like a silly thing, but the one of the things I love about Arizona is 
I'm actually outside more, even if it's in my own yard. Yeah. Um, and more so, you know, like summertime is more in the mornings or evenings because it's so hot. Yes. Um, but that other nine months of great weather we have, it's so nice to just go outside and, and now we have a pool and you have a pool. Yes. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a little bit. But still, to just sit out there and enjoy something to drink. And for us, we're playing with Cinder. Uh, it's relaxing. It's a great way. So now Sherry still works and I'm retired. And uh, so it's a good time to chill out, you know. And I think, I don't know, it just seems like... Um, Getting, it's just being outside more and you can go to restaurants and eat outside and go to Starbucks and drink your drink outside under an umbrella yeah. and, and stuff like that. I don't, do you, do you find when you go back up north that uh, you miss that right away? Um, yes and no. There, it's... <sighs> so many days of the week so many months of the year i could go out there and really just enjoy the weather um get to do a lot more barbecues the weather's more predictable so when i make plans for, to do something outside it ac actually can happen yeah. where is in the you know going back in this case washington you know the weather's unpredictable <laughs> and uh, you know you kind of like if the weather's nice you definitely want to enjoy it um, but it's more of a rarity and not an expectation. <laughs> yeah, I know. So. It's like when you guys got married, you got a, you did an outdoor uh, wedding, and yep. so it's it's kind of nice to know that if you plan something like that, most likely you're going to have good weather. <laughs> yeah, almost every time that we've ever done a, a event, the weather's always followed through, with the exception of one time in the last twelve years I've been here. So. Yeah. I can. I know one time it rain, decided to have a monsoon when I was trying to have a barbecue. So, <laughs> and monsoons are sometimes refreshing. So I, I... It, not this one. This one was a, <laughs> a nasty. Shut one. the doors and hide indoors <laughs> You're when I had thir thirty people over. So <laughs> <We're> <laughs> that didn't work out so well. We were talking earlier, and you were saying a lot of things. You also notice is when people come from out of state, especially from business and and meetings and stuff that you notice uh, they have difficulties uh, dressing correctly or, or caught off guard. There is a there is a little bit of a adjustment to your attire, um, not only in your personal life, but business as well. So for men, I notice that, um, and I, I've worked for many CEOs throughout my entire career, a lot of them coming over from New York and relocating. And um, one of the challenges that they speak about a lot is the changes of their undergarments for their business shirts and um, clothes because they're so used to having much thicker undergarments where here it's just not a realistic expectation to have the thick undergarments um, because of the heat or the, it causes them to sweat and be very uncomfortable. Not to say that they're not using un undergarments that's different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, and I'll, I'll even profess on, uh, on that a little bit is um, I used, you know, there was a time I wore the very thick cotton t-shirts and, and also the up to your neck kind of thing. Yep. And I had to change to, and for guys that come down here, I changed to a, a company called Duluth and got my, get my t-shirts there because they're a lot thinner and they breathe. And uh, I found two areas that really, uh, me, I'm not a real shorts guy, but um, uh, just definitely I wish I should wear shorts more just to be comfortable. But I notice shoes are really important because you can't wear sandals to work. I mean, it's a, it, uh, some people probably do, but I noticed I had to get shoes that breathe better because otherwise your feet are just dying because it's so hot. And so recently I just bought tennis shoes that are almost like a Duluth shirt. They breathe and they're so comfortable. And uh, that's something that caught me off guard because I was, I was wearing tennis shoes that I had when I came down from Washington. But um, the type of clothing is definitely uh, uh, important uh, to be comfortable. Yeah. Now on the women's side, um, it's not uncommon for 
um, the northern half of the country to wear nylons with their dresses and skirts. And it, um, it, they're kind of changing right now, but it's still not uncommon, especially um, the further north you go. Yeah. But down here, you, you don't see nylons for women or even like you said, you were talking about sandals where sandals are more acceptable for females here but not flip-flops. So decorative sandals are now more business appropriate down here than you would see in another state because of the heat. Although they still typically advise against open toe because of some of the, our critters around here because it's not uncommon to have scorpions or even snakes sneak into an office building, which... <coughs> Uh, can make a very exciting day. <laughs> no, sure, uh, your um, your mother, uh, Sherry, she had a, uh, they had a lizard get in the building the other day, which doesn't yeah. bother, but you know, no. still, the, they'll sneak in the house, you know, and that's when it's nice to have a cat. <laughs> yeah, but they get in the office buildings too. So um, through my career here, we've had to address uh, scorpions getting into the office building. We've had rattlesnakes make it into our office um, and other critters like that are not dangerous like cockroaches and stuff like that yeah. and you, it's just advised to stay away from those open toe um, situations yeah. but they they do down here they're way more accepting of sandals for females um, with their business attire so yeah so um <clears throat> let's say I'm, I'm getting ready to move down here and I, um, I, uh, I'm under the age of 55, so I'm not going to be a snowbird. I'm going to be someone moving down here and, and, and possibly changing my career. And uh, uh, in my day, you know, heck, we used to just look at the want ads. You know, <laughs> it was a lot easier. Or we just, uh, uh, you know, things were a little more, you might say, primitive. But nowadays, things have totally changed. And, uh, and there's a couple of aspects of how to look for jobs, techniques for looking for jobs, w resumes, what's a good thing to do for that. We'll take all these at a time, but um, I think it's important that we address uh, a young adults that are coming down here in a new way that they're doing things. And so okay. what's some of the, uh, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm out of state, let's say start with out of state. And I'm well, starting to apply for jobs in Arizona. What's some of the recommendations you'd have? I would, <laughs> uh, well, to be honest, let's take a step back. Um, one of the number of things uh, about looking for a position, um, whether you're coming from out of state or you're local, is if you are in a Even in some of your other jobs nowadays, you really need to have a LinkedIn page. Wow. It is a, it is almost an expectation now that you are constantly working on your LinkedIn page, where you have your your history, your your career history, you um, have your connections, and. as you are even looking more of the social uh, networking job posts sites um, interact with LinkedIn and they will pull your information from LinkedIn into your application with these bigger companies. So one of the biggest mistakes I see is that people don't have a LinkedIn page. Um, they don't mean and working on their professional image through LinkedIn. And by doing that, you really leverage, um, you gain ground yeah. uh, by having that already done because it shows that you're established and that you are always working on your career. It's just a way better perception stepping into the market than not having that. And so one of the biggest mistakes I see time and time again is not having that done. It doesn't even need to be public. It just needs to be available and up to date and constantly looking through it. It just really helps your career. 
So that would be the place I highly recommend that people start is ha making sure they have that LinkedIn page and making sure it's complete. <laughs> yeah, because, like, uh, you know, at my age, you know, like people are maybe still in their 40s and 50s. Yep. You know, they uh, and even your mom, I'll even say because um, yep. she's still working. She um, kind of likes kind of has one going and kind of got it going and kind of let it go and stuff. But yep. You know, when you're older in age, you kind of still want to fall back in the old ideas. And I yeah, think it's it, really important that you and I are saying, no, I don't care if you're 20, 30, 40 or 50, LinkedIn is, is something that you need to take serious. I think it's even more important as you be, uh, if you are in your 30s, 40s and 50s to show that you are current and up to date to the changes that are going on yeah. more and more employers are looking for people that are adaptable and flexible through change and one of the ways you can display that is through making sure that you have your um your online presence set and ready to go and you're you're showing the world that hey i'm still here and i'm still involved and i'm still on top of things that you're not falling back to the old ways and hoping that that will help you out well, definitely, because, you know, I, I think sometimes I get assumptions that people, when they meet me, that I'm not tech savvy or something like that. And it's like I've always pushed myself into it and stuff. Yep. And uh, um, and there's, you know, uh, there's categories I let slide. Like I don't know that much about networking anymore. I used to be good at it. But as times have changed, I haven't had a use for it. But, you know, I'm doing streaming and I uh, um, and do like that. But I, I guess what I want to point out is, uh, and I'll tell people I'm 57 and I still stay up to date on this stuff and it can be kind of fun and I don't fight it. I just accept it going, ah, oh, I know LinkedIn's kind of a pain, but I'm going to go in there and update it. And I, I go in and I do update mine. Um, I don't even really have to because I'm actually retired and stuff. But people look at my LinkedIn to see, well, who is this Rob Scribner? And he owns a radio station. What about him? And what's his background? And so I still, I know people visit my LinkedIn just to look at my background. And, yep. and that's, and I understand that even with doing this, uh, and I imagine if I was trying to get a job in Intel down here or something, if I didn't keep that up to, uh, up to date, because I'm still quite qualified to teach a lot of things in aerospace and stuff like that. And then say I decided I want to go back to teaching. I know right off the bat, they're going to use my LinkedIn. And if I don't keep that thing up, uh, I'm going to really be upset. <laughs> well, the other the other thing that benefits you with LinkedIn is that you can connect with your your peers and other coworkers and they can then endorse your skill set. So it's not right. only you going, hey, this is my skill set. You have a network of people that are going, yes, this I endorse this person for that skill set or I give this recommendation. So one of the nice thing is that, you know, when if I go looking for a job, I can go, look, I have all these recommendations from my peers written in their name. You can go and follow up with every single one of them if you want. And you can see what their opinion, their thoughts are. And for me, it's also very educational because I can see what my peers think of me. So they can highlight my strengths and I could go, well, I think I'm strong. That's an area I need to work on too. So it can yeah. be a great feedback mechanism if you're actively using it as well. Interesting. So, um, uh, so once, you know, so you're saying right off the bat, even before you're starting to look for a job, it's really important that we probably keep that up. Um, yes. So the next thing is um, resumes. Is uh, I, I assume that that's still an important thing to do. It was important back in the, my day. It's, it sounds like it's still just as important today. I think it's changed a little bit from the format that we used to do. <laughs> yes. So uh, it used to be, um, you know, you put your whole career down on your resume, you highlight all your duties, your achievements and everything. And now it's more that they only want to see the last 10 years. So if you have a longer career, um, you need to only highlight the, the last 10 years. Yeah. Um, 
you don't need to go back the 20 years you've been in, in the market and that's kind of nice for those that have more than 20 years because then you're not getting uh, tagged for being older or kind of left out of the crowd for having this long history. Yeah. So it can be beneficial. It can also be a disadvantage because sometimes it, that you want to show how much experience you have in these areas and it goes back further than 10 years. Um, so you, that's where, again, um, being able to link, put a link onto your resume to something like LinkedIn, you can highlight more of that if you needed to for your career. Yeah. Uh, by the way, Derek uh, um, uh, Real Realford, I think I said it right, uh, just moved from Phoenix from uh, to Phoenix from Kansas. <laughs> so that's got to mm -hmm. be quite a change. <laughs> yeah, especially now that it's just getting warm. So <laughs> get ready for. The, the, the hottest part. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I see you saw that already. You're ahead of yeah, me. Yeah, I am. I yep. saw that. I was like, okay, at least you got here in the good time of the year. You can adjust. Yeah. I made the mistake of moving in the mid-July. My first day here was 118, and my first job interview was an outdoor interview for eight hours in a suit. Oh. I I was, yeah, that was <clears throat> a, a little brutal and unexpected. <laughs> yeah. Don't wear black uh, suits in, you know, 118 degree weather. So but, I, uh, if, if you're a little older like myself, well, actually, uh, maybe a little younger and stuff. And, uh, uh, you know, there's this, the worry of being 50 and over. And you mentioned something about um, the resumes being a little different where they really only want about 10 years of your history. Uh -huh. Um, what's the best way for someone that's in their 40s and 50s not to get branded as an old old coot? Um, because uh, I do know to this day that there's still a lot of companies that um, appreciate experience. And uh, they, go ahead. they do, um, but some of the best um, courses on your career development will say if you, once you hit that 10 year mark, you just put 10 plus years experience. Oh. And uh, I found that interesting because, you know, I'm a young in my career, but I have a lot of experience because I started young. So for me, I, I was making the mistake early in my career where I go, well, I have 12 years of experience. But after 10 years, they just wanted you to put 10 plus and then find out more details in a phone interview or a resume. I mean, uh, sorry, an interview um, either through phone or in person. Yeah. Um, but just to put 10 plus years, I have 10 plus years in this skill or eight plus years, you know, whatever it is, but don't go past that 10 year mark anymore. Are they, are they still doing that um, on the top of your resume? You kind of have your, uh, uh, what's the description they put up there? You used to put a, a description of what your they, your goals were in life. You know? No, no um, they used to call it the objective statement. Objectives, and, yeah. Yeah, and that is kind of an old um, style. Now, what you'll see is more of a summary. It's a quick highlight or description yeah, this should be maybe two to three sentences of what your strengths are and kind of what you're looking for. But then after that, you'll um, the ones that get recognized quickly highlight their areas of expertise or their skills before ever getting into their career history. Because you got to remember that because of the um, technology, it's really easy for recruiters to get inundated with resumes. And if you, like, you even need to have a strong title on your resume. The, even the, the name of your file should be a strong name because all they're looking at is for things that are going to catch their eye as they're scrolling through, say, a hundred to a couple hundred resumes for any one position. You so you want to make sure that you're getting those strong keywords in front of the people for them to take more time to look at the rest of your resume. Yeah, and uh, uh, keywords, that's actually, a, 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 I would think is important. This day and age, uh, yes. you know, you have to almost think of yourself as trying to, you know, uh, you're, you're getting interviewed by a search engine. You and are. Like, even when people, uh, even if it's a human. And uh, there's some companies that'll 
actually use software to pick up keywords and then pull those resumes. Yep. And so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, even at my age, I realized the importance of keywords and putting that in that top description or objective area. But um, do you find it um, more, uh, just because you've looked at so many, uh, you know, <laughs> typically a lot of people look at job, um, place their jobs in there in a the description and they can get quite, you know, uh, I worked at such and such for this, yep. this and this and uh, what, you know, reason for termination or whatever and then a description of what they did. And then there's also like the skills area in your resume where you, uh, do you find it, you tend to, at least I know when I looked at resumes, I tend to look at what was the last job they held. And then I typically would go down quickly just because I'm in a hurry. And if they have a skills list of what they think their skills are, I'll look at that. And if it catches my eye, then I go back up and look at the rest of their history. Uh, I don't know how, how you feel about that. Well, um, one thing I want to touch on is just the wording. So it, the one thing that some people still make this mistake about is putting full sentences. Like you don't use full sentences in a resume anymore because you got to remember resumes are being scanned. So it's not like I have this skill. It's you're, you're bulleting, um, you know, your traits. So uh, a professional with 10 years experience, it's not I have or I am or anything like that. Those are all wasted space. So it's mm -hmm. the language is even different. Even when you're list uh, or uh, highlighting your um, your duties and stuff like that, it's you're going responsibilities included um, or includes special projects include. You know, you're not getting super wordy. You want to make sure it's straight and to the point because they are being scanned. Um, I am in agreement that, yeah, you look at the the summary statement, you look at those list of skills, but before I even look at their last job, I look at how long they've been at their jobs. Mm. So especially if anyone's looking for a position that is more of a career versus just a, a you know, an entry position or a transition position, if you're looking or applying for a career, they're going to look to see how long you've been at at a place and if you look like you are a stable um, applicant. So one of the mistakes is that, you know, it's not expected that someone's going to stay at a company for 20 years anymore. But when you're changing jobs every year, that's also concerning to a company because it costs money to bring people in, Definitely. train them and, and get them to you know, what we'd say meeting expectations or really performing. And so it's a, um, it's a risk to, to take a chance on someone that has a lot of jobs in the last 10 years or a lot of jobs where they've only been there for a few months or here and there. So it's really important that if you're currently in a position that you're trying to show some stability and try to stay there over a year and shows that there's some commitment. Yeah. So even if it's a job that you don't like, if you can continue to gain skills out there and get enough length of time in there to show that you are not a high risk um, hire, then uh, it's definitely beneficial to your resume. Yeah, and I would have to say, uh, I mean, some folks that are blue collar workers or white collar, mm -hmm. this is applicable to all sides because yeah. I've noticed even in the world of blue collar, and I came from aerospace, and the technology and things have changed that even your blue collar workers, whether they're a mechanic or whether they're a, um, a pipe fitter, electronics, or, or, or um, um, wiring and stuff like that, they're dealing with more computers and stuff like that. So um, employers are also not only looking at whether you're a welder or not, but they're also checking to see if you have uh, NC experience or programming or have you dealt with uh, uh, process specifications and stuff which are normally now computerized and not in books and uh, so I would imagine that what we're talking about here is applicable and I want to make sure it's important people understand this that we're not just talking about white collar work we're talking about white collar and blue collar because it's changing and uh, the old days of just being a good welder they want to know more 
Yeah, well, on top of that, you got to understand that when you're looking for a job, you're essentially marketing yourself. And you, what people are looking for is, you know, the value that you have to bring. And the more skills that you can highlight um, that you get to bring to the table, that makes you a more, um, you know, brings more interest to you. So showing that you are up to date on the technology um, or even being able to, to follow up when... Um, I'm looking at my contractor, even as a service, I'm following up with their LinkedIn to see what are their skill sets, how long have they been doing the business, do they have recommendations, because LinkedIn it can also apply to those contract uh, positions as well. Um, one thing I would mention, going back to the resume and um, positions and changing, I would say that it is important if you're doing a lot of contract work, as in uh, you're, you're not being hired by the company, it is important to say when a position is a contract job so it mm -hmm. doesn't harm you when people go, well, you were only there for six months. Well, it was a six months contract job and people understand that. So to label those. Yeah. So it doesn't actually come across that you're changing jobs. It's just the term of that contract ended. So it is important to highlight that or state that it was a contract position. Um, but you don't need to be going in there and say, I was laid off here, terminated here, unless they're asking your application. That's just going to hurt you. Yeah. So um, you and I, um, and, and we have a past history where um, you and I actually worked together. You actually ran one of my companies back many years ago. And uh, of course, really you've a had long time ago. <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> and then you've had such great opportunities in other companies since then. <clears throat> and uh, you and I kind of laugh sometimes about uh, when we've done interviewing and stuff like that. What are some of the things that, uh, and I want to be honest to people, and I, I want people to know that what we're going to talk about now is probably what you don't want to hear, but you need to hear it. And, and, and what we're trying to do is get you a job and get you hired. And there's some little things, and sometimes, sometimes big things you and I have seen when it comes to the interview process. What's yep. some of the big no-nos you've noticed that we'd like to pass on, not to kind of laugh at it, but at the fact that it really prevented that person from getting that job? Well, there's the big no-nos and then there's the little ones that people don't think about. So the big ones, that, and uh, you and I joke about a lot, is that, you know, don't bring your girlfriend to the interview. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's the one you and I got. We had a time, I got to yeah. mention it. We actually had somebody come in for a wire, uh, um, website design job and literally brought his girlfriend with him literally to the interview and uh, so that was one of those interesting where we went through the motions but it was you know we're not hiring that guy <laughs> yeah yeah you, you pretty much don't have a chance if you can't go to the interview by yourself like you're only hiring one person <laughs> so <laughs> That's right. it's definitely a no-no um, you know, attire is important. Even when they tell you that you can come business casual, you should still step it up a notch. Um, I, I would also recommend that you, you dress for the position. So, for example, I ran a call center for many years and I found it very unnecessary for someone coming in for an entry-level call, call center position to come in with a, a suit and tie, especially because a lot of times you can tell that it didn't fit them properly. It wasn't something that they were comfortable in. I w much prefer they come in business professional, definitely the slacks, the business shirt. You can even put on the, the tie if you like. Um, I think it, it says a lot more when you do, but I don't think it's necessary but you don't need the jacket in that particular position. Yeah. Now, if you're coming in for a leadership position, then yes, you need to have the jacket, the tie and everything like that. But you don't, for an entry level position, I don't think people need to be spending crazy amounts of money getting a jacket for a one-time interview for them to look really uncomfortable and for them not to fit them properly. I just think it says, more it causes more distraction than what they have to offer so um and that might be against kind of an old school way of thinking but you'll see more 
more people leaning that direction. Um, it's just you, attire is important. Now, some things that are no nos that people don't talk about a lot is, you know, um, hygiene is one of them. Like, there's yes, make sure you do your hair, you brush your teeth, and everything. But women can actually overdo it with their makeup or even their perfume. Um, same thing with guys. I've had guys do it too. When they come in wearing cologne or something so strong, you just it can't wait to get the interview over because you can't breathe. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, and that happens more frequently than you think is that you need to understand that you want someone's attention. You don't want to draw them away. And so to overwhelm someone with... Um, you know, a clone or perfume um, can actually work against you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I've had it myself where I was like, I want to talk to this person more, but I literally cannot breathe. <laughs> and, um, so I, I do want to ask you, and this is sensitive, and this is not, this is the stuff we don't talk about, but we're trying to help. Yep. Yep. is have you found any distractions where I, and I found and I'm saying I've been just distracted and I'm not supposed to be yeah. with like um, uh, if a lot of tattoos or piercings or a bun or some kind of funny thing that you've done unique uh, uh, is it I'm not against those I know it's a different generation now but is there a, like appropriate time like oh, maybe I should take some of that stuff off right now or maybe I should wear clothing that, uh, that covers up a little bit of my tattoos and stuff because you may be in a company that's uh, uh, sensitive to, uh, you may be a person that greets customers and stuff. And so they're going to be looking for that, like, okay, you're going to represent my company. Um, and I'm looking at you right now. Would I want that person to represent my company at the front desk or as an administrative assistant and stuff like that? And I know the laws and all that kind of stuff where we, you know, like we need to be open-minded. We can't be prejudiced against it and stuff like that. But, you know, uh, when you own a company or when you're a boss or a CEO, um, even though you can't out say things out loud and stuff, does that or can that affect your interview um, result? I think it can. Um, I I know it can. Um, I'd hate to, to say it that way, but, but yeah. people are trying to manage the risk of a, a hire. It's a partnership. They're looking for someone that's going to complement their business yes. as well as yours uh, investment, and you want to know that you're getting the, the best investment that's out there. So um, I highly recommend that unless you're adamant about working for a company where they do not care about your tattoos or piercings or stuff like that. Um, you play it safe. You cover them up and then you pose that question. Even if you have a phone interview, um, you might want to get a sense of the culture and the attire. But even here in Phoenix and you have a, a tattoo sleeve, you might just want to cover it up for that initial interview so that you give yourself the best opportunity. Yeah. Um, some people absolutely have no problems with it, but there are certain industries that still really are against those. I know that I um, talked to a nurse before and they said a lot of um, hospitals don't allow their nurses to have exposed tattoos because of the perception. Yeah. And um, why some people don't mind um, it can cause people to feel uncomfortable about their nurses' capabilities of taking care of them when they're covered in tattoos. And whether it's right or wrong, that's the perception. Right. And um, I don't necessarily agree with it, but there are times where it can be distracting, especially distracting. if it's on your your face, um, the, the heavy piercings or the big gauges and stuff like that. I think they can be really... Um, they can work against you if they have two applicants, one um, with it and one without, and you're going to be in a customer facing position or a vendor, you're working with vendors or anything like that. They might go with the person that has the appearance that's more neutral. Yeah. And, and, so. and we're bringing this up because uh, not because I mean, I, I know it's not right that maybe I didn't hide, hire somebody that had tattoos all over their necks and, and uh, gauges in their ears. 
it, that was just charming and did a great job. But uh, unfortunately, the, the realities are is uh, uh, if you can restrict that and stuff, uh, especially in the interview process yeah. where I'm not distracted because I found myself back when you and I were working together with uh, hiring folks, someone come in with like a pierced nose or something in her eyebrow or something. And all I can do is during the interviews, like, I wonder if that hurts. <laughs> Like, so I'm I don't all, find distracted. it that distracting. I mean, I see a lot of women that might have the little, um, yeah, the little piercing in their here. nose. Yeah. And I think sometimes it's, it's beautiful. I think tattoos, some of them are amazing yes. pieces of art. Um, but if we're talking about just getting opportunity, especially while you're looking for a job, um, to give yourself the best opportunity is just to not to make it a non-issue. Yeah. Um, let them fall in love with your personality first before getting distracted with the cover um, of what you're presenting. Um, now, there's some industries that really embrace it, and they're pretty open and honest about it. Not yeah. only in their conversations, but they'll do it in their job postings. They'll do it on their website. You know, and then in that case, you can definitely um, be a little more lax. But if you're talking about those office settings, the big, you know, it just depends how, you know, how much opportunity you want to give yourself. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, another thing I find really interesting, and uh, you probably don't get as much of it as like uh, my uh, Sherry's described to me, but, you know, we got all these new, and I come from an aerospace industry, so we got all these new states starting to legalize marijuana and i certainly understand uh especially i mean if it helps someone in chronic pain or uh, out of the military and has a post uh, i don't know the right wording for that um anxieties and stuff like that uh, i i think there's some real solutions with using uh, marijuana products uh, and i can see why they're coming along however in so many companies, especially that deal with military contracts and stuff like that, um, uh, the biggest problem that's starting to happen, and, you, and I've only known this from, uh, from um, hiring statistics, that some people are not employable because they can't pass the drug test. And but, that's true. Um, it, you gotta remember there's a lot of jobs that require um, like uh, operation of vehicles. So yeah. anything with the operation of vehicles or equipment like that, um, companies are not ready to to take on the risk of someone being under the influence of a anything. anything. Yeah. I mean, they not don't even marijuana. like it. Not just marijuana, but the, a lot of things because of the risk. I mean, companies, when they're bringing on employees, they're measuring risk and opportunity. And that's what it's important for applicants to understand is that it's the business is, you know, looking for someone to help them out, but they are also measuring the return on it. And if you come back with, um, you can't pass your drug screen, even if you're on medical marijuana, you know, that's a risk that a company might not be willing to um, take on, especially depending on the position. Yeah. Now, there's some position where it's a non-issue, but, you know, anything with the um, operating equipment, um, driving, because um, I've worked with several companies that require drivers, um, any any use is just it's too high of a risk for the yeah. company so it's kind of two areas you know you got the fact i mean it may be legal in your state uh -huh. and currently it's still illegal with the federal government and a lot of people that have federal government contracts or yep. military or outside countries re require drug-free environments well and even it, travel yeah. a lot of positions require travel out of state yeah. So, like, if you're meeting with vendors, if you're in a, a business development role where you're constantly going to conferences and stuff like that, you then could be, you know, breaking a law in another state under the, the company's hours. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I, I want to remind you that we have about four minutes out. And what I wanted to point out is what are some of the things that you've seen in interviews that just knocked your socks off? just really go someone came in did a job and maybe they even didn't even hire him but they're really impressive 
what are some of the, can you remember some of the ones that they just walked in and go damn <laughs> i i can tell you that everyone that i ever considered hired did one thing really well and i the new generation is not doing this enough and they're getting away from it and it's a problem it's coming with a list of questions a pen paper and reading up on the company so being prepared you know what the position is you know about the company you have your list of questions and you're ready to write down more being prepared I can't tell you if you do not come in with a piece of paper and a pen ready to write take notes I don't take you serious and I am not the only manager that's that way wow, because I, that's actually really good I really never thought about that that's, that's yeah. yeah that that makes a lot of sense well you want someone that didn't just throw out a bunch of resumes you want to make sure that when they came to have a conversation with you that they're respecting your time just as much as you're respecting their time so they did their research they have a general idea what's going on but they're prepared. I'm yeah. like, who does not want to see an applicant be prepared for an interview? That, I'm like, that is so good. Yeah. So like, if that's the biggest takeaway and success that I've seen with everyone I've hired is that they were prepared. Some of them even had their portfolio. They even had books of their awards, which I think is going even above and beyond. But hiring managers love that. Like it's hard to find people that are prepared <laughs> and That's when you do it right there in my first introduction with you I'm like you already stepped above I'm gonna give you more of my attention because you're ready to, for my time yeah. and it just is just a great way to, to start an interview is being prepared yeah well anything else that you just little subtle things that you've noticed in the in the past I know it's kind of hard to like gotta go back and remember all these interviews we did but... um I, you know, um, the way they came in, the way they greeted, the way they talked to people, uh, manners, any kind of things that kind of stand out that you've, uh, be, the prepared one is probably number one. I, I the, agree the prepared with you. one is the number one. Um, I think it, you know, uh, be, I know it's cliche, but being the textbook interview, come in, be dressed appropriate, be prepared. Um, some small etiquettes, I can tell you the handshake is important I am a female and when I shake another female's hand and it feels like there's nothing behind the handshake I am de I definitely feel less enthused about that interview yeah. uh, versus someone that's coming in and even in their first handshake is a little more confident um, walking uh, through the door if it's a, a male letting me go th first showing the proper etiquette and I think sometimes people out, um, have a hard time with remembering to use just common etiquette in their interview process because um, I think that goes a long way with especially older generation leadership is it showing that you have you know proper etiquette in a social setting yeah how about eye contact oh you it's a must if you can't look at my eyes or at least pretend you're looking at me like <laughs> It drives me bonkers. That will actually distract me more than <laughs> someone with the gauges. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I was like, you know, and be comfortable in asking questions. It is, it is a, it's like a date. I always try to tell people that I'm like, treat it like a date. We need to get to know each other because the fit has to be right for both the company and the applicant. It's not just about the company and the fitting their needs. Have a little confidence that you want to make sure that you're finding a good spot for yourself as well. So take care of your needs. Um, sometimes they put too much e emphasis on the business, but if you're looking for a career, you you want to have a relationship that you could go in and spend 40 plus hours with every week. <laughs> yeah, and I think another thing I'd want to bring up is uh, because I know that the newer generation is a me generation, you know, they want the bing bang chairs and, and donuts at lunch all the time. But um, I would still would recommend not bringing that kind of stuff up where uh, I know new generational are kind of like, okay, I'm going to work for you. What are you going to do for me attitude? And no. I still think they need to keep that under under wraps. Um, no, like it's okay to ask, you know, about the environment and stuff like that. But you are getting hired to provide a service, so the company that you're with is going to want to know what you're going to be able to provide 
to them. I mean, you are the service. You are what is being sold. That they're not hiring you um, just because they want to fill in a chair. They usually need something accomplished, and so they need to understand what you'll be able to accomplish for them because they're investing in you. Yeah. And so uh, it's okay to you know ask about benefits or paper t uh, paid time off and stuff like that. But you know, keep it simple because you still need to sell yourself to the company on what you can offer them. I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, they sign the paycheck. And I think one of the things I want to, as a wrapping up this uh, this show, is uh, a lot of people still need to realize we we're talking about marijuana, we we're talking about presentation stuff, that they need to realize that when you're going in for a job interview, you're working for a company that one is liable for you and is going to pay you and hopefully also have uh, services like health insurance and, and vacation and stuff. So their, their concern is their investment, which is you, the individual. Yep. Uh, employees are an investment. And um, I think a lot of folks uh, maybe, the, and I'm, I don't want to brand young generation. It, it can happen with older too that you feel like oh, they're privileged to have me. And it's, no, you need to also realize you may be privileged to have a company that will support you and stand behind you and give you not only training and healthcare and a paycheck and things like that and, and not take that for granted. And uh, I think um, take that chip off your shoulder and, and say, I'm here to work hard and I wanna present myself well and in return, I assume you're going to give me a paycheck and give me some benefits because if you like me, I know you'll want to keep me. And, and I think uh, a lot of people need to know they need to go into that humble attitude a little bit. And it's good to be, you know, uh, believing in yourself and everything. But it's also you need to be a little humble knowing that companies, there's money involved here and liability. And I think that gets forgotten sometimes. I don't know. What do you think? I would agree. Um, I think people need to understand that, you know, business is hard, especially if a company is in their first five years, yeah. they're trying to succeed and employees are some of the most expensive um, assets for a company. And so um, they are looking at what the, you can provide for the company and for, you got to remember, it's getting more and more expensive to bring in an employee between the cost of benefits, the taxes, I mean, everything, just the wages, uh, minimum wages going up and all the expectations that are, are changing. It's getting harder and harder for even small companies to hire. Sure. So it is, um, at the end of the day, I think it's important that you have to understand that you ha will have to give more to the company than the company is going to give to you. And I think it, it sounds harsh, but at the end of the day, if you have the right mindset, you won't be disappointed because they are paying you for a service and they're giving you that in return for something. Yeah. And if you go with that attitude, you can actually find that your career will grow faster because you are supporting the company and their objectives and their business. And you'll actually go farther in your career knowing that you'll have to put in more than you'll get out. Yeah. Well, hey, uh, we're at the end of our uh, show here. And Tracy, I mean, this, this was a great show. Um, there's a lot that you can get out of the show. Play it over a couple of times. <laughs> That's all I can say. A um, lot of great advice. We want everybody to be successful no matter what generation. Um, and also for companies that are hiring, uh, understanding their needs is really important. I think both of you and I agree with that because we've been business owners. And yes. uh, anyway, uh, Tracy, I can't thank you enough for doing the show on Arizona Talk Radio. I hope, <laughs> I hope you'll be willing to do some more shows with us because uh, this is really Absolutely. good stuff. And yeah. so uh, we love Arizona, both of us, uh, you know, and we came from the outside looking in and now we're here. We love this place. We want everybody to be successful. We know there's people that want to move here. There's plenty of room. We got lots of room. We can take more people, especially you guys, poor people in California. Come on over. Anyway, yeah. uh, <laughs> anyway, Tracy, thank you very much for doing the show with us. And we got to get going.
Thank you for having me. Take care, everybody. And thanks for watching. Hey, thank you for listening and watching Arizona Talk Radio. Please take the time to like, subscribe, and share our videos all over the whole wide world. We'd really appreciate it. Till next time, bye now.